Welcome back, ChemStars. It's Ms. McCauley, and I'm going to be going over pages 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11 um, in the Chapter 1 practice with you. So if you're here, all of these pages, all of these problems should already be filled in. Um, you should have already watched the flipped video lecture, and you've either completed the Foul Water Lab in class, or you've watched our virtual Foul Water Lab. So these pages are all going to talk about substances and mixtures. Let's get started here. Okay, so some definitions. A substance... We also call that a pure substance. You'll see that in our notes too. So sometimes you'll see pure substance. Sometimes you'll just see substance. So the important thing to know is that a pure substance has a chemical formula. You can write it out. So some examples of pure substances would be things like H2O, water, um, maybe things like O2, oxygen. Okay. However, mixtures can be any in any proportion, and the parts are not chemically bonded. For an ex example, we could have something like salt water, like the oceans. You could separate out the salt and the water and the little fishies. So we want to go through and figure out, are all of these a pure substance or a mixture? So I'm going to actually write PS, pure substance or mixture. Okay, pure substance. So I'm going to do a quick scan through, and then I'll go back, look for mixtures, and if anyone's tricky, we'll put a star and discuss them. So sodium, I can find that on the periodic table. The formula is Na. It's a pure substance. Water, that's our good old H2O. So if I'm saying just pure water, it's a pure substance. Soil, and I don't know a formula for soil. I'm going to skip that one. Coffee, I know how to make coffee, but I don't know a formula for it. Oxygen, the oxygen gas that we're breathing in right now, O2. That is a pure substance. Alcohol. That's an interesting one. I'm going to come back to that at the end. Okay, carbon dioxide, CO2. You breathe in oxygen, you breathe out carbon dioxide. There's a formula. It's a pure substance. Cake batter. I haven't seen that on the periodic table. I have seen it in my kitchen, though, and it's a mixture I know of um, flour and sugar and funfetti sprinkles and eggs and oil. Here's a hint. Ms. McCauley's favorite cake flavor is funfetti. Remember that. Air. Hmm. Well, I know the air I'm breathing in is nitrogen mostly, oxygen, CO2, water vapor, dust, dander, all kinds of stuff. So that's got to be a mixture. Soup. Pick your favorite kind of soup. Maybe it's chicken noodle or lentil soup. That's a mixture of a lot of stuff. Okay, so I'm looking for easy ones I know the formulas for. Iron. Chemical symbol is Fe. So that's a pure substance. Now salt water. I gave you the example, like the oceans. We can separate that salt and water. That's not it. Ice cream, it's delicious, but not pure. Nitrogen, that's on the periodic table. That's going to be a pure substance. Eggs, hmm. My two corgis love eggs, but they're not on the periodic table. There's no formula for that. Blood, okay, think back to biology. Blood's made up of red blood cells and white blood cells and plasma and gases and nutrients. That sure sounds like a mixture to me. Table salt if you're not aware, is sodium chloride. There's lots of different types of salt, and table salt is NaCl. It has a formula, so it's a pure substance. Nail polish. You have to shake up nail polish when you first use it, don't you? So that's definitely a mixture. Milk. Hmm. Milk and cola. Can you write a formula for those things? No. Milk is a mixture of water and fats and proteins and all kinds of stuff. And cola has a super secret recipe. Um, so like Coca-Cola, it's a lot of stuff. Read that ingredient label. Okay. So I went through and we did all the easy ones that we know are pure substances. Now to see if it's a mixture, there should be different components that it can be in any proportion, but they're not chemically binded or chemically bonded. That means mixtures can be separated. Okay, so that's kind of the question we're going to ask ourselves here. Soil. It's a mixture. I can go through, I can pick out the dirt and the rocks and the grass roots and the worms and all the other stuff that's in there. Coffee. How do I make it? I mix beans with water and maybe cream or flavoring. That's a mixture. Okay, the alcohol one is tricky. So if we're talking about chemistry, um, there's different types of alcohol. There could be isopropyl alcohol, um, ethanol, methanol. So if we say something like methanol, oops, I should change my color. Hold on. Pretend this is the right color. So methanol is a pure substance. 
ethanol. Another type of alcohol is a pure substance. Um, we could have isopropanol, which is isopropyl alcohol. That's a pure substance. Notice how they all end in all. Those are all types of alcohol that are pure substances. But if you were telling me alcohol, like an alcoholic drink that you'll have when you're over the age of 21, um, that would be a mixture, be a mixture of water and chemical elements from ethanol and other types of things. So we just want to be specific with that. If it's a chemical alcohol, it has a specific name and you can write a formula for all those specific names. Okay. Um, cake batter, it's definitely a mix. You got to mix it together. Air, here's what's in air. It's mostly nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, water vapor, and you can actually separate all those out if you've got the right equipment. Soup, alphabet soup. You can pick out all the letters of the alphabet. Salt water, it's literally salt plus water. If you evaporate it, or if you ever walk through a salty puddle in the winter to get that salt ring on your jeans, it can be separated. Ice cream, let's say rocky road. You can pick out all the different chunks in there. Eggs, you have the white, you have the yolk. It's definitely a mixture. Blood, it's a mixture, okay? Look at it under a microscope. You can see all those different parts, components, and cells. Nail polish, you've got to shake it up. It's a mixture of different pigments and chemicals. Milk, um, definitely a mixture. Cola, definitely a mixture. Good, so that's your page seven. If you don't agree with any of these, put a circle, star it, and come to class ready to defend your question. Okay, let's go to page eight. Okay, so on page eight, now we're going to talk about homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures. So homogeneous, prefix homogeneous, it means that they're the same or they are uniform throughout. You don't have to mix it. You don't have to shake it up. There's no chunks. If you see the foul water video, you'll know what I mean by no chunks of stuff. There's no chunks. There's also no layers. There's not oil floating on top. Okay, but a heterogeneous, that prefix means different. So they are not uniform. There are two or more phases, or there's layers, or there's chunks of stuff. Okay, let's go through first and look at things that we think are heterogeneous, where there's different layers or chunks you could reach in and pick out or separate off. Flat soda pop, no bubbles. That's one thing I want to call your attention to. So no bubbles. So if you drink some flat Coca-Cola and there's no bubbles, it's uniform throughout. So it is heterogeneous. That's going to be a lot to write. I might just do a check mark in the right color. Black raspberry chip ice cream. There's going to be hunks of black raspberries in an ice cream base. That's heterogeneous. Italian salad dressing. There are chunks and layers. We've got to shake it up, get the oil and the water mixed. There's hunks of seasonings. That's heterogeneous. Hmm, sugar water. Pretty sure that dissolves. Soil. Rocks, worms, grass, dirt. Definitely different pieces, different phases. Brand new pennies. That seems kind of weird. We'll come back to that one. Iced tea. Now, this one, I have to ask you some questions. Do you put lemon in your iced tea? Do you put ice in your iced tea? If so, it's heterogeneous. We'll come back to this one. Maybe you like your iced tea warm. You've melted all the ice and it'll be homogeneous then. Ooh, freshly poured soda pop, bubbles. So is that heterogeneous or is that homogeneous? Oh no, did I do all these backwards? Oh, look, I made a mistake. Let's go back. So freshly poured soda pop, it has bubbles. It is heterogeneous. Iced tea with lemon and ice, it's heterogeneous. Soil with chunks, it's heterogeneous. Italian salad dressing, it's heterogeneous. Black raspberry chip ice cream, it's heterogeneous. What the heck was I doing on the first one? There's no bubbles. So this is our example where it's homogeneous. Oh, crazy Ms. McCauley. Must be wearing my mask and face shield too tight on my head. I think we're back on track now. So heterogeneous, things that are different with chunks and layers in it. Okay, city air. I used to live downtown. I can tell you there's lots of pigeons. 
There's lots of feathers, there's soot, there's smoke, there's just generally trash floating around. So is city air uniform? No, it's got a lot of stuff in it. Paint. The first thing you got to do is you have to stir your paint can if you're painting your room. You got to mix all those different oils together. It's heterogeneous. Flat coffee. No ice, no whipped cream, all plain. This one we can debate in class. Technically, coffee has a little bit of oil in it. If you have a really like high quality espresso, you can see that oil come out and it floats on top. But usually if you go to Dunkin' Donuts and get a black coffee, it's pretty uniform throughout. So we'll, we'll talk about that one more. So heterogeneous, things that have chunks or layers. Rusty iron fence posts. They have like bubbles on them, don't they? There's a rust layer, there's an iron layer. Beach sand. Ooh, we need a microscope to figure this one out. Pure air. So no dust. Look around you, wherever you are right now. Hopefully there's no pigeons flying around, no dust. Pure air, that seems pretty uniform. Spaghetti sauce. Okay, well, what kind of spaghetti sauce? I like to eat spaghetti sauce with like big chunks of tomatoes and herbs and seasonings. That's definitely heterogeneous. But when I was a child, I made my mom strain plain ragu to get the onions out, so I didn't like it. That was pretty homogeneous. So that one, we could debate. So let's go back now and see if I made any other crazy mistakes. Let's look for things that are homogeneous, that are uniform throughout. So flat soda pop. There's no bubbles. It's homogeneous. Sugar water. So um, in geology, we make some geodes this way, but if you stir up all that sugar until it dissolves, it's going to be uniform. You could get to a point where you put so much sugar in that it won't dissolve anymore, and then it would become heterogeneous. Now, new pennies. Technically, these are an alloy. They're not solid copper. They're a mixture of zinc and copper. So looking at a penny, have you ever noticed that some of them start to wear through? It's not like a pure alloy. There's usually a copper coating on the outside and underneath it starts to change. So uh, this one we can debate in class more. So if we slice it open and there's two layers, then it would be heterogeneous. But if it's an alloy that's mixed together, it will be homogeneous, okay? So we need to actually maybe cut open a penny and look what the inside looks like to see, is it an alloy? Is it mixed all the way through? Or are there two layers? We'll do a quick Google search and figure that one out. Or bring in some cut open pennies. Okay, iced tea, that's another one. If there's lemon and ice and different stuff in it, it's heterogeneous. But maybe it's warm. <laughs> maybe you let it warm up. There's no lemon chunks, there's no ice. Then it, it, it could be homogeneous. Mm, let's see, black coffee, probably homogeneous, depending on how technical you want to get on those oils. Beach sand. I want to pull up a picture of beach sand. So I'm going to pause for one second. Okay, so here's the first picture of beach sand from Google Image Search. And it looks kind of uniform. It looks kind of the same. Well, I mean, there's a starfish right there. But let's look at a microscopic image of beach sand. So underneath the microscope, beach sand is really crazy cool. There's all these fossils and corals and seashells and bits of quartz and mica and feldspars. So is beach sand, is it uniform throughout? No way. So beach sand is heterogeneous. And so we're going to color that one blue. Beach sand looks crazy cool. You want to make sure you look at the microscope view, though. Microscope. Okay. Um, the other one we weren't sure about was pennies. So we know it's made up of zinc and copper. Are they alloyed together or are they sandwiched? So if you do a Google search of a penny cut in half, let's take a closer look. Look right here. It's copper on the outside, but on the inside, it's that silver zinc metal. So this is your modern pennies. So um, on here, this is a modern penny. So post 1982 it's actually like a sandwich we saw in that picture so the new pennies are like a sandwich that means that they're heterogeneous so they're like a sandwich they are heterogeneous if you look at a pre 82 penny they're actually 100 percent copper and then that would be homogeneous. So this paper specifies new pennies. Well, what does new mean? We'll say post 1982, okay? 
So some of these are a little tricky, might need a little bit more background information. Come to class, ready to debate some of these with us. Okay, now let's go on to page nine. And we're looking at pure substances versus mixtures. Okay, pure substance can be element or compound, and mixtures can be either heterogeneous or homogeneous. So all matter, how do we know it's matter? It has mass, and it takes up space. It has volume. If it's not matter, it's energy. So a pure substance, we can write out the chemical formula, and it's always going to be homogeneous. An element is a single atom by itself, but a compound, we have two or more bonded elements. So when we did our modeling activity in class, either with the M&Ms or with the, um, the ball and stick models, they're connected. So that's our pure substance of atoms or compounds. And also there's elemental molecules here too. But the mixtures, they have a variable ratio. And the other thing, mixtures can be separated. They can be homogeneous, homogeneous. They're solutions. You can't see the different phases. Or they can be heterogeneous. They can be collides or suspensions. There will be chunks. There will be layers. But the homogeneous will be uniform. Okay, so there's some key reminders for us. So we're going to go through and classify each of them as either a pure substance, then tell me element or compound. And if it's not a substance, it's going to be a mixture and tell me heterogeneous or homogeneous. Okay, so the easiest one to do, I think, for me would be to look for things that are on the periodic table and I know they have a chemical symbol or I can look up their compound. Chlorine, symbol is CL. Water is H2O. I don't have a formula for soil. Sugar water is sugar plus water. Oxygen is O2. Carbon dioxide is CO2. Well, here I can see I got a mixture. Rubbing alcohol. So let's figure out chemical formula for rubbing alcohol. C3H8O. Okay, C3H8O. So remember I said before different types of alcohols have different formulas? This one we specified that type of rubbing alcohol. Pure air. We know that one's going to be nitrogen combined with oxygen, combined with carbon dioxide, and a lot of other stuff. And then iron is Fe. Okay, so that's just quick past what I know. So anything I can write a formula for has to be a substance, an element or a compound. So the chlorine, it's one thing by itself. Water is an oxygen. This one technically is a diatomic element. Remember that from modeling? That wasn't a choice here, but be specific. And iron, that's an element. It's one thing by itself on the periodic table. Okay, let's look at our compounds. They have a formula. So water is a compound. Okay, sugar is a compound and water is a compound, but when I mix them together, they're going to be a mixture over here. Okay, CO2, that's a compound. Ice cream with sprinkle, no. Rubbing alcohol, I've got a specific formula, that's a compound. Pure air, it's made up of compounds and diatomic elements, but they're mixed together, so no. Okay, now we have to look at our mixtures. Let's look for the heterogeneous ones first. Um, I'm just going to do a check column, this might be easier. So heterogeneous, there are chunks or layers. Homogeneous is uniform. Okay, so soil, is soil uniform? No. There's chunks, there's earthworms, there's dirt, there's grass, there's all kinds of stuff in there. How about sugar water? Is sugar water the same when it's all dissolved? Yes, so it's homogeneous. Okay, ice cream with sprinkles in it. Not uniform, definitely heterogeneous. There's chunks, sprinkles, maybe there's some air bubbles. And then pure air. So only the gas is mixed together. There's not a pigeon that's going to fly through and hit you in the head or poop on you. Homogeneous. Okay, good. So again, if you want to debate any of these, come to class prepared with your arguments. Let's go to page 10, how to separate mixtures. This is like the foul water lab. I'm going to be pretty um, brief on this. You should be a little bit more verbose, give a little bit more detail, but think about how you could separate these. There's more than one right answer. So if you've got something else that works, don't change your answer. 
um, just make sure you're ready to share with us. So sand and water, I could filter them, right? I could get a coffee filter or some paper. It would catch the sand, the water would go through. So filtration. Sugar and water, we need to use evaporation. We could heat it up on the stove and get the sugar back a lot faster, or we could just let it sit in a jar for a couple weeks and make rock candy. Oil and water, how about that one? Well, a couple options. We could skim it off the top like they do for oil spills out in the ocean, or we could use a separatory funnel. I'm not sure if I spelled separatory funnel right. But that's what we used in the foul water lab. That was that little like teardrop shaped glass funnel. Okay, sand and gravel. Hmm. We could use a sieve or a colander, or you could hand pick all those pieces apart. You also could use a series of screens. That all would work. Ooh, a mixture of heptane. That's a chemical with a boiling point and heptanol with a different boiling point. This is from your video notes. You would separate these via distillation, okay? Give a little bit more information. So you'd heat it up at 98 degrees, all the heptane would come off. And then when you get to 176, all the heptanol would come off. You can collect those gases um, with some special glassware. Okay, here's one that's a little bit different. A mixture of iodine, that's solid, and sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is also solid. That's table salt. So how would I want to pick all those apart? Well, another thing is that iodine is purple and sodium chloride is kind of like clear or white. You could hand pick this, but that would be miserable. You could sort all those grains. And also iodine is not the best thing to touch with your bare skin. But here's a hint. Iodine is not soluble in water, but salt is. So we could dissolve in water. Then you'd get the iodine. And then we could evaporate the water and you can get the salt back. Okay. How about a mixture of salt and iron filings? Well, iron's not soluble in water, but salt is. We could do the same thing. Then my iron's going to get rusty. So it's possible, but make, might make more work for yourself. The other thing we could do is use a magnet on this one. Iron's magnetic, salt is not. So there's definitely more correct answers than what I've gone over. If you thought something creative, please share it with the class. So don't change anything you had, just add to it. Okay, we got one more page left. We're almost done, guys. So let's look at this page a little bit more in depth. This is your page 11. And now we're looking at separation of mixtures again continued. So identify the separation techniques. Think back to our foul water, foul water lab. That's where we learned some of these. Which technique would be useful to separate a mixture of sand and salt? What about of sand and of salt and water? So this one right here, this is your regular old filtration. We did this with the cheesecloth and with the sand and gravel um, in the foul water lab. And over here, this is the distillation setup. So this is where you want to boil mixtures and the different components will evaporate. They'll come up as a gas and then they'll cool down and they'll come down here as a liquid. So here's a liquid. Up here, we've got a gas, and then down here, we have our liquid. Okay, so what's going to be useful where? Okay, sand and salt. What could we do? We could, uh, we said on the previous page, we could add water. And now we can go into this filtration. You get the sand caught here, so this would be sand, and this would be our salt water. So that brings us to the next question. How can we get the salt and water separated? Well, put our salt and water here. The salt will stay. And then the water, the H2O, will boil off. Okay. So explain why the technique at left would not be effective for separating a mixture of salt and sugar. They look the same. Salt and sugar are about the same size. 
and they are both soluble in water. So if we just ran water through them, well, they both would end up in the bottom through the filter. Not a good way to tackle that separation. Okay, now we're going to draw some particle diagrams, a mixture. So it's iron and sulfur. They're separate. So I'm going to make some little iron atoms. Okay, and then I'm going to make a sulfur atom. And let's see, I'm going to try and put a text box in here maybe. Oh, I'll just do different colors. So iron is going to be black and sulfur will be yellow. And can I label this? A iron. Text color. So here's my iron. And then right here, we're going to have my sulfur. Oops. Okay. Hold on one second. Okay, so here's my mixture of iron and salt. See how that they're not connected? They're not touching. There's no bonds between them. I could reach in and pick them apart. How could I separate them? Well, I could reach in and pick them apart by hand. It'd take a long time. A, a magnet can separate iron atoms. So iron is magnetic. It will stick to a magnet, but sulfur is not. So if you pass a magnet over here, it's going to pick up all those iron atoms. Now, what would a compound of iron and sulfur look like? Okay, so this one, there'll actually be a formula. It'll be FES, iron sulfide. So what will that look like? Well, think back to our modeling activity with the model kits or with the M&Ms. And this time, they're going to be touching. They're going to be sharing electrons. They've formed a bond. And when we have this compound, the compound itself is not magnetic anymore. Okay. So magnetism is unique to iron, but this new compound that iron is in is not necessarily magnetic. Okay. So if I pass a magnet over top of this, it's not going to pick up anything. So why does the magnet, why does it separate the iron? Well, it's by itself. It's not combined. I can pick it up in this mixture. But when I'm in a compound, the compound's not magnetic anymore. It's a new thing with new physical and new chemical properties. Okay, that brings us to the end of our mixtures um, and substances. Pages 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. You should have already done page 12. Um, so thanks for listening, guys. Remember, don't wait to be great. I'll see you next time.